I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. As you may know, I've been doing a series on how to live together that focuses on practical ideas and skills for our relationships with individual other people, friendships, family members, colleagues, partners, parents and children going both ways, and also extending further out into groups and communities, nations, and the whole wide world, the whole human tribe all together, roughly 8 billion of us, and growing on our precious planet, how to live together. So I've explored a number of topics so far. Last time it was love and power. And now I'd like to talk with you about trust, mistrust, and deep trust. Trust is a central subject in psychology, uh, including in relationships. And the roots of it uh, are in our very earliest moments, our first breaths, our first years. So I kind of want to take you back, if you could, at least in your imagination, to what it was like for you during the first year or two or three of your own life, when you were certainly at birth, utterly physically dependent upon the care of others. Unique in the human species, we have the longest childhood of any species on the planet. And one of the reasons for that long period of dependency upon uh, caregivers, notably mothers and others, um, that long period of dependency enables the long enlargement of the human brain, which quadruples in size, essentially, from that of a newborn to an adult in terms of its total volume. So we come out dependent and we start learning really quickly what can we count on and what can we not. Now, that learning in the first several years typically is registered mainly in the body. That's called implicit learning. And one of the reasons for that is that one of the major systems in your brain that's involved with emotional memory formation, the amygdala, tracking both pleasant and unpleasant, but being biased usually to activate around unpleasant, the amygdala is fully locked and loaded by roughly the seventh month in utero. I don't have a uterus, by the way, although I'm pointing roughly in that direction for illustrative purposes only. Anyway, inside a newborn, inside the mother who you know may not be being treated very well by others or have issues of her own or be stressed, whatever, um, that baby can f experience fear and form memories associated with fear. But another really important part of the brain that's also involved with memory making, in particularly to put things in context, to see the bigger picture, the hippocampus, well, the hippocampus doesn't tend to become anatomically mature until around the third birthday, which means that that's one major reason why we don't usually have what are called episodic recollections of our childhood. We may have a kind of a sense in the body, and there's a lot of learning, a lot of um, internalization of experiences in the first three years, but we don't tend to have clear memories, most people, of anything during those first three years, certainly not the first year or so. And this is one reason why. Well, this means that as newborns or in, and as infants and toddlers, we experienced things intensely with less capacity to regulate our feelings and their intensities and less capacity uh, to put things in perspective, see the bigger picture, and kind of understand the whys and wherefores for what's happening around us. That's our biology. And in that frame, we start forming uh, beliefs or assumptions, expectations about what we can count on from others, including especially the people who are most important to us. 
So I'm going to tell you two stories from my dissertation research, um, which I did in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, um, on mothers and toddler pairs, 15-month-olds, 10 boys, 10 girls, as at least they were identified at the time. And I went into their homes with a big, bulky, imagine, video camera with a battery on it, maybe a cord. I'm talking 1990 here. And I videotaped interactions between the parents and the and the, their child, uh, and just one child would be present there. And I also had them make a batch of ginger snap cookies with their child in a high chair nearby. I brought the supplies and the bowls and the equipment in, so it was very standardized. And then we would see what would happen when there was a collision of wanting between the parent and the child, which is where the rubber really tends to meet the road in early childhood. And I want to tell you two episodes. One episode was a little boy sitting in a high chair with his mom adjacent to him. So it was like the little boy would be looking into the camera like I am, and his mother was seated right here. And the instruction was very open-ended. I gave them a recipe, and I said, the job is to make a batch of ginger snap cookies with your child. And very straightforward. Well, if you've ever tried to cook with a 15-month-old, you know, there are many opportunities for control episodes, for a collision. And then you see what happens, right? Now, this particular mother was very conscientious. Uh, she said all the right things, and it was clear she really intended them. She was very conscientious. So this particular episode was especially striking. So now, they're making the cookies together, really interesting to a little kid. Oh, big wooden spoon, boom, boom. Oh, spice, pour it in. Oh, stir it up. Whoa, globby things. Wow, fantastic, right? And the mom, boy, she was on task. She was going to make the most perfect batch of cookies that could be made conscientiously, maybe compulsively, obsessively, really sucked into the task. And the little boy... At a particular moment, little episode I watched and rewatched on videotape later, uh, as I was coding it scientifically for my study, um, he was just waving the wooden spoon happily, cheering it all on. And without looking at him, she reached out to the side and just took the wooden spoon from his hand. Not roughly, but just took it out. He was quite startled. So now she's using the wooden spoon, she's stirring, she's reading the, the menu, the instructions, and he starts fussing. He's like, ah, ah. You don't, I mean, it's not hard to speak toddler 101 at a basic level. He wants the spoon back, right? Having a good time, wants the spoon, feels good, feels powerful, it's exciting. The spoon, he's helping, he's part of the game, wants the spoon. Mom, oblivious doesn't notice it, doesn't hear it, doesn't even acknowledge what he wants. Um, and then, so she's sitting there, he gets increasingly agitated after a fairly uncomfortable 30 seconds for me, maybe longer. She looks up, looks at him, kind of a little bit, almost as if she's coming up from underwater and goes, oh, the spoon. And you could see him, oh, relax. Like, oh, she gets it. And then she goes back to what she's doing with the spoon, ignores his desire. She acknowledges it and ignores it, goes back to it. And then you can just see him slump back in the chair in despair. If you work with infants and families, you never want to see despair. Not angry, rather of an angry child than a child in despair. This was not a bad mom. This was a kind, conscientious, wanting to do a good job mom who just, at least then, and who knows what you could generalize from that episode, you know, probably you could actually, uh, was in that episode and maybe in other episodes, not someone that this 15-month-old could count on to understand what he wanted and care about it, at least in certain situations when the mom was busy doing other things. 
another little episode. And um, I want to be really clear, uh, what I'm exploring here with you happens between children and fathers, children and peers, children and siblings. It's us and the world. Is the world trustworthy or not? Where is the world reliable and where isn't it? In what cases does the world look trustworthy and reliable and suck us in and then, like Lucy with peanuts, whatever, Charlie Brown, there we go, whips the football away and pulls the rug out from under our feet. The bottom falls out. Wow. Never saw that one coming. Better learn from that one, right? Reforming expectations about people, the world, and ourselves, which I'll get to in a minute. Are they trustworthy? Are they reliable? Are they predictable? Uh, will they come through? So here's the second story. Uh, different mom, different son, coincidentally. And this boy wanted a pickup. So the mom came over to the boy and kneeled in front of him. And the boy was saying, ah, ah, pick up, ah. And she just came over to him, kneeled in front of him, and just looked at him with like a very slight smile on her face and just looked at him. He got more and more upset. Ah, ah, ah. I wonder, I guess in her mind, maybe she thought she was teaching him not to ask for a pickup. Uh, maybe she was trying to teach him to not be demanding or something. This is a 15 month old, right? Pretty, really young still. Uh, I don't know what her motivations were. It was kind of eerie. There she was, there she was present and unresponsive. You know, in some ways for us, if they don't get what we want, if they don't understand it, if they don't receive our signal for whatever reason, at least, you know, we then we can give them the benefit of the doubt, maybe. But if clearly they got it, like in the first case, the mom, oh yeah, the spoon, or in this other case, the mom just being there with her arms at her side, inert, uh, looking at the boy. In both cases, clearly, the other person, the caregiver, received the signal. And then for them not to respond, having received the signal, whew, really impactful. So I'm telling you these stories, and I hope I'm not triggering <laughs> too, too much, to just illustrate how consequential uh, fairly brief episodes with the world can be, especially if they're a recurring pattern again and again and again. And understandably, we start to form, as I've said, expectations, beliefs about what we, what we can count on, who we can count on, under what conditions, and in what conditions are we on our own. So I invite you to kind of look back, you know, steer clear of anything that just feels too overwhelming to, to really look at it. But on the whole, just kind of ask yourself, what did you form? What beliefs, what expectations did you form about reliability or trustworthiness or betrayal from other people and the world? And you could even sort it into certain categories to the extent that they're meaningful. Mothers, fathers, siblings, school kids, men, women, teachers, coaches, authority figures, people like me and people not like me. And then changes. You might just kind of reflect on um, paths you took through your childhood, maybe in which you started out with uh, a very wide uh, sense of trust that was then disappointed, even betrayed. Or maybe you started out in early childhood, uh, you know, really not having a 
reliable, trustworthy caregiving around you, but then as you made your way later and later in the world, maybe with other kids or other adults, like a coach or a rabbi or a, um, an uncle, an aunt, uh, you found people you really could trust. Maybe an early love uh, with someone who really saw you. I had that experience as a 15-year-old that was extremely important to me. Um, you know, what's your journey with trust pin? And then through adulthood and up to the present time. So this is a normal process. We need to develop models of the world, models of others, different conditions, what's reliable, what's trustworthy, where would the ground be stable? And where are we on thin ice or no ice at all? The natural process. And then how can we be wise and suffer less and harm less with regard to this? Wisdom is found in healthy trust and healthy mistrust. And by mistrust here, I don't mean an aggressive, grumpy, hostile attitude. I mean it more neutrally as, oh, like for example, um, you know, I've done a fair amount of rock climbing and I was doing a fair amount of that in July. And there were certain clambering around on boulders and things like that. You, you put your foot on the boulder, you're coming down a boulder field, let's say, and it's very chaotic and scrambled and uh, easy to get hurt. So you put your foot on a boulder and it starts wiggling under your foot, eh, mistrust. <laughs> you know, you put your foot on another boulder and you kind of poke it a few times, solid. Okay, I'm gonna trust that. So I mean, healthy trust, healthy mistrust. Well, so healthy trust, basically means trusting at a scale or in proportion to what is actually reliable, particularly related to the risks involved. And if we trust more than the field of reliability, that's unwise trust, that's unhealthy trust. If on the other hand, we trust less than what is actually trustworthy, well, that's full of missed opportunity. For example, in the boulder field there, if somehow I felt that all the boulders were unreliable, and any one of which could break my ankle coming down a thousand feet or so, I wouldn't be able to do anything, right? So that would be unhealthy mistrust. It would be too small, the field of trust. And it's interesting that in terms of forming these models of trust mistrust, we're very affected wisely by how much we trust ourselves. So I wanna really talk about trusting ourselves because the more we can wisely and accurately trust ourselves to be resilient, to come back, to learn, to make efforts over time, to approach situations in good faith, with an open heart. The more that we can trust ourselves in those ways, the more that we could trust ourselves to see clearly and to learn when we were you know, mistaken, uh, then the world doesn't have to always be so perfect to be trustworthy enough. Right? In my Boulder Field example, I'm quite experienced uh, doing that kind of thing after many years. So I can trust my physical abilities and my you know, uh, learned motor movements pretty well. Someone who was a beginner at coming down a big boulder field appropriately would have less trust in themselves. So they needed a really, really, really kind of perfect path coming down because I have accurate trust in my abilities, including to move quickly <laughs> if the boulder shifts beneath me, uh, then I'm more able to move through a field that's not perfectly trustworthy. Think about this in relationships. The more you can trust yourself to uh, be patient with other people, to be assertive when you need to be, to have compassion, to have some interpersonal skills, well then the other people don't need to be so perfect because you can manage things more. So this whole idea of increasing your trust in yourself, both by becoming more trustworthy factually and by being accurate in your appraisals of yourself, that's really important. Um, 
I think people tend to not trust themselves enough on average. We can make a big mistake. We can think that we're actually capable of doing something. Like I could trust myself to drive after four beers. And that's a you know big mistake there. Um, I could trust myself to say the right things when I'm really, really mad. Maybe, <laughs> you know. On the other hand, most people generally uh, underestimate their capabilities, their resilience, their endurance, their perseverance, their goodness, their skillfulness. And so here's an opportunity when you reflect on this, including in key relationships, what could you trust yourself for? And you know, it's interesting when you just take a moment to realize maybe in a troubled relationship that you can trust yourself to come into it, much as the Buddha taught, with goodwill rather than ill will. You can trust yourself to learn to practice what I called unilateral virtue, that you're going to act in good faith, you're going to practice right speech generally, you're going to have good intentions, uh, you're going to be open to input. You know, the more that you can know, yes, I am trustworthy in that way. Yeah, maybe if I get super duper triggered in the worst moment when I'm exhausted and I haven't eaten anything, okay. But 99.97% of the time, I can really trust myself in this important relationship. And that can give you a wonderful sense of reassurance and relief and can open the door for you to step further into a relationship and you know, maybe talk about some things that have been difficult or try to repair something that's been hard. And also, if you can trust yourself to see clearly, you can then be more willing to go out on that first date, <laughs> perhaps with someone, or um, to meet a new person because you know that you're gonna be clear-eyed and you're gonna recognize issues pretty quickly. You know, they did it once, don't know. They did it twice, whoa could be a pattern here. Did it three times, yep, I see it, I see it, and you can trust yourself to see it. Well, if you can trust yourself to see clearly, then you can take chances more in the early days of relationships or in opening things up because you know you can pull back and, and shrink the relationship if you need to. So you see the relationship? It's really wild, isn't it? Um, between trusting yourself and being uh, more able to wisely trust and mistrust the world. Uh, I want to name four qualities, and I trust you to be okay that I'm dressed informally tonight, you know, because it's hot where I live in San, in San Rafael, California. One of the best ways to go forward here the world varies in its reliability. When the chips are down, many people disappoint. They won't come through or they'll come through partially, uh, astonishingly so sometimes. You know, people, the world varies. Things happen, people have a lot on their mind. Um, conditions in the world really affect people. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Many people, because of structural 10,000 years, of wealth inequality and economic conditions and all kinds of other things adding up can wear hard on people. For whatever reason though, people really vary in how much you can count on them for. And there are other conditions in the world too, the weather, the economy, natural disasters, things like that. But meanwhile, you can really develop yourself so that you are more and more worthy of trust. You are more and more reliable. You deliver the goods more and more reliably, not because you're being dominated by others, but because it's enlightened self-interest to be um, a stand-up person and walk the talk with other people, be someone that others can ride the river with, to borrow a phrase from Western novels. Um, and I wanna name four qualities in particular that I think are very foundational for being a trustworthy person and being and knowing that you can trust yourself. The first of these is honesty, that you tell the truth. You see what you see, you tell it to yourself, you tell it to others who are allies and supporters, 
as need be, you tell it to those who are not. You're honest. Uh, maybe you wiggle, <laughs> get a little defensive initially, but very quickly, you're willing to cop to your stuff. You, 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 you name it. Yep, I was late. Yep, um, I, I forgot to do the thing. Yep, um, you told me, I nodded, but I didn't do it. Honesty. Yep, I, my head was nodding, but inside my mind, I was a thousand miles away. <laughs> honesty, and honesty with yourself, including recognizing how you're a work in progress, right? Second, effort. You know, are you willing to make efforts? Uh, I believe it's attributed to the great teacher, uh, bless his memory, Mara Baba, who was frequently quoted as saying, don't worry, be happy. And I believe most people who quoted him left out, I think, the last two words he uttered. And if this is not attributable to Maribabia, Maribaba, uh, take it on face value. Don't worry, be happy, make efforts. Make efforts. A lot of people don't make significant efforts, including toward things that really matter. Doesn't mean you have to kind of crush yourself under your thumb. Doesn't mean um, being, um, you know, dancing to the drum of other people, it means you know putting in an honest day's work so that when you clock out, whatever that is in a sense, you go, yeah, good on you. You tried hard today. <laughs> what else can we ask of people? Try hard today. Try hard today. Yeah. So make efforts, effort. And then, of course, learning. A third, call it a virtue that makes us trustworthy, including able to trust ourselves, that we, we learn, we're open, we learn, we recognize, oh, this could be better next time. Oh, what's the takeaway? Oh, I'm gonna implement that takeaway. Learning, we can be counted on to learn, All right? Wonderful. And then last, repair. We show up for the repair. We're we try to repair, we're open to repair, uh, we're willing to hear the needs of others, the desires of others for repair uh, in our relationships with them, to heal misunderstandings, to um, recreate agreements, to clarify misunderstandings, uh, to lay a foundation for going forward, to establish basic goodwill. You know, we're there, we're there for repair. Be there for repair. Um, that makes people trustworthy. So four qualities, honesty, effort, learning, and repair. Think about that. Anything to cultivate more of these days? All right. When we recognize that our trust is larger than the field that supports it in the causes and conditions of reality, that, for example, we have been counting on someone for something and more and more it's clear we, we can't count on them, maybe something has changed for them. Maybe we could count on them for that, but increasingly not. For whatever reason, what can we do? What can we do to establish healthy mistrust, which is the boundary of our trust? Well, as much as we can, we can resize the relationship can disengage from certain kinds of interactions in which the other person's just not reliable, reliably appropriate. They don't have to be perfect to be reasonably reliable, to keep their agreements, to not be a jerk, to be interested in you so it's a loosely reciprocal relationship. They're not total takers. They're not, you know, a narcissistic um, um, hole that you have to keep pouring you know, supplies into, uh, otherwise they punish you, um, you know, you start to realize, no, I'm going to step back from that. Or maybe I'm just, you know, going to wrap up this project with this person and once was enough, or the seventh time was enough. I got it now. We're not going to work together again, or at least not in that, in that way. Um, you know, so we shrink the size of relationships to the scale that we can actually trust. And, um, you can get pretty subtle about this. Like I've, I know people um, where I just realize I cannot trust them to really tolerate the communication of my personal need. 
period. Like, oh, okay, so I have a choice. Do I break off the relationship or do I just realize, Rick, every time you go to that well, <laughs> you're, it's painful, it's disappointing, it doesn't happen. And it seems to make things worse in the relationship. So I'm just not gonna go there anymore. You know, and then you have to decide what your choice is. But for me, that's an example uh, of a subtler form of shrinking in a relationship. So there too, you might th ask yourself, you know, in important relationships, can I see clearly? You know, maybe my gut is telling me that this person I really can't count on in all the ways I'm, I'm trying to make them count onable, right? And there's a place in the beginning where we try to make people count onable or nudge them or influence them or inspire them, persuade them, create the conditions, you know, appeal to them. And there's something to do. Yes, that's good to a point. But after, you know, how many? Two, three, 10 at bats trying to encourage count onableness? Go, oh, I can't count on you for that. You know, maybe there's some learning there for us. So here too is something to maybe think about expanding the field of some relationships because actually the basis for trust is big in there or realizing oh, I need to shrink the scale of this particular relationship. Okay. And then as I finish here, I want to talk about deep trust because certainly as you know, and as central to the teaching of the Buddha, things fall apart. Tread your path with care in the Buddha's last words. Things change. Nothing stays the same forever, right? The truth of impermanence. And kind of really broadly, uh, the ways in which everything is linked together. So reality has a kind of instability to it. It's foamy. It's empty of essence or solidity in a sense. People change, people pass away, people move out, children grow up, leave home. Uh, the body starts to break down. These are changing conditions. So you might rightfully ask, Rick, how in the world can we find any reliability in reality? And since reliability is the basis for trust, how, how can we find any, any trust anywhere? It's a great question. Uh, and it takes us to deep trust. Now, before I go there briefly, my mom toward the end of her life um, uh, was asked by someone, uh, you know, what she appreciated about her husband, my father, Bill. And uh, they had been married probably 55. They married, they were married their entire, you know, um, when each of them passed away, they were married. Or my mom died first, then my dad later, they were married. And um, she said, she paused, she said, well, he's very reliable. And at first people kind of shook their heads, like that's the best you can say, Helen, you know, my mom's name, that Bill is reliable. And, you know, my, neither of my parents were very gushy. They, you know, they were raised in the depression and really challenging circumstances in different ways. And um, it was not their culture really to be gushy. And in what my mom said was actually a profound, profound acknowledgement and appreciation for my dad because she had a variety of health issues and, and other needs, especially in her last 20, 30 years. And my dad was reliable. So it's okay to seek reliability in our ordinary relationships and to be someone who actually is reliable, including drawing on those four qualities of, um, of honesty, effort, learning, and repair, to be reliable, to be trustworthy yourself. That said, as we step back and look more at the big picture, yeah, what can we deeply trust in, in an ultimate kind of sense? So I want to mention six things. I have a little list. I'll go through them very briefly, and then hopefully I'll be able to respond at least to questions in the chat. I don't know if I'm going to have the time tonight to uh, talk with anyone individually. And I think next week I'm going to continue this theme, and we'll have more opportunities there. All right. 
So first, what can you really trust, right? What can you really trust? In a context in the Buddha's last words, things fall apart. Tread your path with care, with conscientiousness and love, two aspects of care, okay? First, you can trust in your own natural goodness. Really, deep down, maybe covered over, maybe <laughs> yanked away once in a while, it's your own deep goodness. You can trust in that. Can you locate it? Can you find it? Can you uncover it increasingly through practice, including the kind we explore here uh, once a week? Um, can you, you can trust in that. It's not a question. It's not, can you trust in it? Of course you can trust in your natural inherent innate goodness, your goodwill, your good intentions, the warmth in your heart, fundamental benevolence in the core of your being, the fundamental deep wish to do the to do the right thing, to do the helpful thing, not the hurtful thing, to build instead of destroy, your own natural goodness. You can trust that. Second, you can trust in love. Bet on love. We have to place bets in this life because we don't have perfect knowledge. And there's an inherent dynamism, even at the level of quantum instability and the fabric of material reality. Um, still, if we're going to place our bets, bet on love. Bet on your love. Bet on the love, the current of love moving through you, the love living through you that lives you and can carry you along. Trust in love. You can trust in love. Trusting in love can occur alongside recognizing the boundaries of actual reliability in other people. We can be loving with other people while not trusting them, you know, as far as we could toss, you know, a pebble. Uh, and so it's not inconsistent with trusting in love to be clear-eyed and, and strong in reality. Third, you can trust in life, in the web of life, in life as life. There is life. We are life. We are life. We can trust in the ongoingness of that. The forms change. Terrible things happen. Human-caused species extinction. Um, asteroids hit the planet and wipe out 90% of the animal species um, 65 million or so years ago. Ballpark. Uh, you know, okay, but life as life, being life, being life, living life, in life, through life, as life, you can trust in that. Trust in life. Getting a little maybe less concrete, you can trust in the suchness of the present moment, the isness of what it is. In this moment, it is this. This, now, this is now. It is what it is. We can count on it. It's going to become something different in the next moment. And then in that moment, it is what it is, the thisness of now, continuously. And as your practice deepens, Mind gets less cluttered, gets calmer, gets more open, more spacious, maybe with some breakthrough experiences. More and more, you, you're resting in a continuity of thisness, continually changing. But the thisness of this, whew, you can trust in the thisness of this, the suchness now. That's not so logical. Don't, we don't have to get all twisted conceptually about it, but when you kind of get it, ah, the present moment is trustworthy as what it is, because it is what it is in the present. And you are inextricably an aspect of the thisness of now.
You are in the fabric of what you can trust now as this. Wow. Next, we can trust in the nature of things. Things change, but the nature of things continues. The nature of things as impermanent. We can, we can trust in that, the fact of change. We can trust in the interconnectedness of everything. Nothing arises on its own. Nothing passes away on its own. That interbeing that Thich Nhat Hanh described. We can trust in that. Oh, that's in the nature of things. We can trust in the, in effect, emptiness in the nature of things that is continually allowing the emergence of the next thing. This again might seem abstract, but when you kind of go, wow, things are unreliable, things change, the nature of things is where you can take your stand and find your refuge. They sound kind of crazy, right? Trust in impermanence, trust in interconnectedness, trust in uh, everything or, you know, arises dependently upon everything else, trust in um, the lack of the emptiness, the absence of absolute self-existence, identity, essence, solidity in any phenomenon. Trust in that, try it. Suddenly it's kind of like going, all right, whoosh, flop backwards and still here. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then if you relate to it, I do. You can trust in an underlying ultimate reality, whatever it is. Maybe you leave it at mystery. Beyond the beyond. Beyond language. Maybe that's a way to talk about it. Not subject to arising and passing away. The Buddha talked about that which is unconditioned, deathless timeless. Maybe that's your sense of an ultimate that is inextricably woven into the continuously emergent reality of each moment inside our Big Bang universe. Maybe this ultimate reality is a kind of field or ground in which the um, ongoing streaming of the expanding in space and time Big Bang universe is occurring, whatever it may be, timeless, unconditioned, boundless, whatever is true about that, we can trust in because it's for sure true. And whatever's true about that is really, really true. It's the ultimate truth. We can trust in that. It is what it is. We can trust in it. And for some, and you know, I can say, including in some ways growing for myself, there can be a sense of a kind of transpersonal uh, pervading awareness in that ground of all with a kind of, with benevolence, with a blessing quality, with love, if you can relate to that. Or, or simply as I am, gradually be exploring in that direction, certainly with a sense of unconditioned, timeless boundlessness. You can trust in that. The Buddha did. So, I hope this has been helpful for you, not too wild or wacky. You might want to reflect just about these, this deep trust in a changing world. Phenomena continually are changing. What can we trust deeply? 
And I'm telling you from my heart that you can trust in your own natural goodness. You can trust in love. You can trust in light. You can trust in the thisness, the suchness of the present as what it is. You can trust in the nature of things because they keep on being the nature of things made of parts that are connected and changing. And you can trust in whatever is the ultimate because that really is what it is which the Buddha pointed to as unconditioned, timeless, and boundless, and others have found in which, and others have found in that uh, qualities of awareness and love. Whatever is true for you in that area, you can trust in these things. And meanwhile, keep your eyes open and cultivate greater trustworthiness in yourself. Thank you very much.